Sequels are tricky to make. I know, one hell of a controversial statement. But I think this statement is especially valid in the case of Bioshock 2 for a number of reasons. Developed by 2K Marin, Bioshock 2 dropped just two and a half years after Rational took the gaming industry by storm with the original. Bioshock's impact was so big that it not only propelled the games as art discourse to new heights, it also made the industry take a collective look in the mirror and reassess its direction. A direction concerned more with profits than artistic integrity and innovation. For a while at least. And just to clarify, I know gaming is a business whose purpose is to ultimately make money. I'm not naive and I'm not gonna babble nonsense about gaming studios selling out or some weak shit like that. No. The point I'm trying to make is that Bioshock was, in some ways, the swan song of what many consider the golden age of gaming, which spanned roughly from the mid to late 90s to the mid 2000s. A period of experimentation when the gaming industry hadn't yet fully established itself as a commercial entity driven by profits. Bioshock was essentially the culmination of that particular current, a high budget, niche, light immersive sim game which itself was an homage to the games that inspired it, with which it shares a lot of of his DNA. Bioshock had such a profound impact on its medium that the sequel should have been a slam dunk. And it was. Bioshock 2 not only excels as a sequel, it surpasses the original in every possible way. Yet Bioshock 2's reception was lukewarm to say the least. Why? Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that. But I'll do my best to explain why I think the sequel is better than its predecessor. So consider this video my official Bioshock 2 manifesto in review form. The ultimate bumbling defense of a 12 year old game that this obscure YouTuber believes didn't receive enough love when it came out. Before before we jump into the game, please be warned that this video assumes some degree of familiarity with the first Bioshock, whose story beats I will occasionally reference when appropriate. Also I will renounce my no major spoilers policy just for this video, as tiptoeing around spoilers makes analyzing Bioshock 2 competently nigh on impossible. Spoilers will be marked just in case you want to experience this game for yourself, and for your convenience and to some degree mine, I will position the non-spoilery sections at the beginning and enter Spoiler Town from the halfway point of the video. Also I have a Twitter where I tweet about the games and a Patreon where you can support the channel with like real life money. Let's get to it. My husband is such a perfect idiot. Bioshock 2 kicks off on New Year's Eve 1958. A night which, if you're familiar with the lore of the series, coincides with the date things in Rapture took a turn for the absolute worse. After getting a refresher on when and where this game takes place, we're treated to a first-person view of an infrastructural quirk that must have been an absolute bitch to design for the urban planners. The little sister's hidey hole. From it emerges Eleanor, a little sister who calls you daddy and is more than happy to tag along and participate in whatever shenanigans you had planned for that day. And just in case the game wasn't clear enough as to our identity and purpose in this world, this reveal here should dispel any doubts. We assume the role of a big daddy. And not just any big daddy, but Subject Delta, who is part of the first functional line of protectors, fittingly called the Alpha series. We'll talk more about this later in the video, but for now, all you need to know is that unlike the big daddies we see in Bioshock 1, who had their skin and organs permanently grafted to their diving suits, the Alpha series have more or less retained their human shape. Anyways, following the reveal we get an intimate glimpse of their day-to-day -day activities, as well as a brief but revealing peak of Rapture before its downfall. I gotta say, it's kinda funny seeing these people recoil in disgust at the mere sight of a big daddy, you'd think they'd gotten used to them at that point. Sometime later, the pair become separated, and after saving the little sister from a mob of splicers, we're treated to the first major plot twist not three minutes into the game. Eleanor is not just any little sister, but the daughter of Sophia Lamb, a major figure in the city's high society second only to Rapture's own founder, Andrew Ryan. More on her later. In one of the most unpleasant scenes in the series, Sophia Lamb forces Delta to take off his helmet and shoot himself in the head. Delta awakens in 1968, resurrected by little sisters under the direction of Eleanor. Upon awakening, Delta is immediately contacted by none other than Bridget Tenenbaum, the genius geneticist who discovered Adam and kickstarted the little sister program. She informs Delta that he will die unless he finds Eleanor due to their physical and mental bond. 
Finding Eleanor will not be easy, as Rapture went through a change in management and is now ruled by Sophia Lamb and her cult. And that's pretty much it as far as the premise is concerned. It's a significant departure from the original. If Bioshock 1 placed Rapture at the center of the narrative, with Jack the protagonist serving the role of a mere conduit through which the player could absorb the world building, Bioshock 2 flips things around by making the stakes more personal. This move made total sense, Rapture was no longer a new thing, so 2K Marin wrote the story around the assumption that players, whether new or returning, would be roughly familiar with the setting. And again, more on the narrative later. For now, let's focus on the gameplay. So Bioshock 2 is essentially a mechanical revamp of the original, with a few twists thrown here and there. So I'm just gonna focus on the improvements. As great as the first Bioshock was, it did have some significant issues with the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. For one, the hacking minigame was tedious and overused. Now it's a real-time minigame that involves matching a moving needle with the right color. Green is good, blue gives bonuses, white aborts the hack and inflicts damage to the player, and red triggers the alarm system. Being real-time adds a much-needed sense of danger and urgency to hacking. In the original Bioshock you had to constantly switch between weapons and plasmids. It was clunky, verging on unintuitive. Now we can have a plasmid in one hand and a weapon in the other. This simple change opens the door to a plethora of tactical possibilities and decreases the likelihood of the player falling into patterns and sticking with the same plasmid weapon mix. I found myself experimenting with different builds organically, a miracle considering I'm exactly the type of player described above. I know, what a bizarre thing to be for someone whose favorite genre is the immersive sim. It also helps that 2K Marin and invested a lot of effort into improving the gunplay. My biggest gripe with Bioshock's gunplay was the floatiness and lack of proper physical feedback of the weapons. That's no longer the case in Bioshock 2. Even better, they've added a bunch of new weapons which can be loaded with different ammo types. My favorite addition has to be the spear gun. When fully upgraded, it can one-shot more splicers and even two-shot some Alpha Series Big Daddies. Another area that was significantly improved was the moment-to-moment -moment exploration. Don't get me wrong, Bioshock 1 had some great level design, but it relied too much on the novelty factor of the setting and locations to alleviate the shortcomings of its linearity. Bioshock 2 is linear as well, but it makes up for it with scale. Levels contain lots of optional areas that players can search for extra loot, pieces of storytelling and solutions to problems. For example, I needed a code to access this clinic. Next to the door I found a strategically placed audio diary which I assumed would contain the combination. But instead of just giving me the code, the writers invented a short story around this guy whose job was to periodically think up new codes to keep looters away from the clinic, and decided to mull it over for a while at a local diner. So I went to the diner and found the code scribbled on a newspaper next to his body. It was a small moment but I loved how it was implemented. Here's a fun fact that adds absolutely nothing to the video. The name of this character, Tobias Reapers, and the code he chose, 0047, are an obvious reference to Hitman. Fun fact that adds nothing to the video part 2. According to an audio diary that was cut from the game, Tobias came up with the code by reading an old newspaper article and picking the first numbers that he saw. The number, 47, was the death toll of the Kashmir restaurant bombing of 1958, which set the tone for the Rapture Civil War. It's also one of the first locations players get to visit in the original Bioshock. What makes the exploration and combat even better is the way plasmids interact with the environments. You know, stuff like using Firestorm to melt ice and uncover secrets, Electroshock to zap malfunctioning door switches into submission, telekinesis to snatch out of reach loot. On the combat side, bodies of water are just as electrifiable as ever and boy, launching swarms of insects at splicers never gets old. Combine the plasmids with the fine-tuned gunplay and the great level design and you get one hell of a satisfying gameplay loop that is objectively more enjoyable than in the original. Of course I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the one defining feature of Bioshock 2, being a big Daddy. Now, to be perfectly fair, Bioshock 2 wasn't the first time players got to control a Big Daddy. That distinction goes to the original Bioshock, where towards the end of the story, Jack suits up before the final boss. However, apart from severely limiting the field of view with the helmet, nothing much changed on the gameplay front, which was a huge missed opportunity. Well, in Bioshock 2, players get a full Big Daddy experience, both from a gameplay and story perspective. All the weapons and gadgets that players used to fear and long for in the original game are now at the player's disposal. The iconic drill, showcased with the gory pump of a David Cronenberg film in the opening hours of Bioshock, is literally the first weapon players get in the sequel. When paired with 
improve the dash ability that it'll become stupid fun to use. There is also the just as iconic rivet gun for precision sniping and the machine gun for crowd control. It's worth mentioning that unlike the original game, it's impossible to fully upgrade every weapon through the course of the campaign, so you'll have to specialize. My advice, look up a guide before committing to a specific weapon. Also important, you may be a big daddy but you're not invincible. OG Bioshock big daddies were monstrously powerful, so I was curious how 2K would account for this potential disconnect. And they did. Unlike Bioshock 1 big daddies, you are a prototype, actually the first one to be successfully bonded to a little sister, hence the Alpha in the Alpha series. So it makes sense that you are below the fully developed big daddies in the pecking order. This brings us to probably the most intriguing aspect of this series the little sisters. The mechanics revolving around them are pretty much the same, to a point. You need Adam to buy and upgrade plasmids and acquire gene tonics, essentially passive abilities that give certain bonuses. You can only do that with the help of a little sister, but they're closely guarded by big daddy, so you have to kill their protectors. Now here's the kicker, after defeating their assigned big daddies, you can choose to adopt the little sister or harvest them for their Adam outright like the monster you are. If you're not a monster and decide to adopt them, the little sister will escort you to quote unquote special corpses, which they'll then harvest for Adam. This will attract the attention of splicers who you'll have to repel while the little sister is uh, doing her thing. It's a pretty nice twist that adds a layer of strategic depth to the gameplay. It's also a good incentive to try out new weapons and tools. Of course, I wouldn't feel like myself if I didn't bitch. As fun as this mechanic is, it wears out its welcome rather quickly. For me, it happened around the halfway point of the campaign. So each little sister has a certain number of corpses they can harvest. Once that limit is reached, you have to kill another big daddy, adopt the little sister, harvest the appropriate number of corpses, and repeat that same process for free even 4 times per level. To say it's repetitive would be an understatement. Don't get me wrong, I like this mechanic on a conceptual level, and I respect 2K Marin's effort to implement the big daddy little sister dynamic into the gameplay, but I wish they'd done things differently. Maybe by increasing the number of corpses a little sister can harvest, or decreasing the amount of big daddies in each level, I don't know, I'm not a game designer. Now there is a positive aspect to this mess that I've saved up for after I'd finished complaining. Harvesting or saving little sisters will provoke attacks from their older dangerous counterparts the big sisters. They are little sisters who have become unstable due to atom consumption and mental conditioning. The extent of their plasmid powers go beyond those of a regular atom user, as they've been exposed to this substance from a young age. Why? Well, the scientists leading the little sister program were kind enough to implant atom containing sea slugs in their stomachs. Bioshock 2 does a great job explaining how big sisters came to be, if you're curious. For now all you need to know is that you'd better be prepared for when they come, because their powers surpass even the ones of a fully developed Big Daddy. Alright, we're about to enter spoiler town population me, so if you want to experience this game for yourself, skip to here. They're gone? Okay. Let's talk story. Before deep diving into the nitty gritty of Bioshock 2's world, I'm gonna start with a brief plot synopsis with some analysis sprinkled on top to offer some context for the following sections. So Bioshock 2 begins on New Year's Eve 1958, when, as I said earlier in the video, all hell broke loose, and Rapture devolved from a capitalist fake utopia to a full-blown dystopia. Subject Delta, aka the player character, aka you, patrols the streets of Rapture with Eleanor, his little sister, when Sophia Lamb, her overbearing mother, separates them, forcing Delta to eat himself. Fast forward to 1968, when Delta awakens in the post-post-Rapturian apocalypse. Nine or so years after Andrew Ryan, the red herring antagonist, and Fontaine, the actual baddie, like, you know, died. Delta is contacted by Bridget Tenenbaum, the literal and metaphorical mother of the little sisters, and informs him that he'll kick the bucket unless he gets his rusted metal ass going and finds Eleanor. Why does he need to trudge through the knee-deep filth of Rapture to find Eleanor instead of hollering at another little sister and go about his business? After all, that's exactly what Bioshock 1 Big Daddies did. Well, the main difference between the Alpha series, which Delta is a part of, and other Big Daddies is the nature of their bond to the little 
little sisters. Each Alpha series Big Daddy is created with an unbreakable physiological bond to a little sister. If the little sister dies, the Big Daddy falls into a coma or collapses into madness. Even something as simple as the Big Daddy wandering too far from his little sister can potentially break the bond. So essentially, Alpha series Big Daddies are glorified golden retrievers. A sentence that somehow saddens me more than I thought it would. Man, I love golden retrievers. Great fucking dogs. Anyways, with the help of Eleanor herself and the suave, smooth-talking Augustus Sinclair, Delta makes his way to Lamb's HQ. On his way, he encounters members of the Rapture family, a collectivist cult led by Lamb who had since filled the power vacuum left behind in the wake of Andrew Ryan's demise at the end of the original game. You know the drill, more on them later. Eventually, Delta discovers that Lamb's plan was to use Adam, the sea juice that both kickstarted Rapture's social and economic boom and led to its demise, to transfer the minds and memories of Rapture's citizens into Eleanor, to create the perfect, selfless, collectivist leader. Following this discovery, Delta comes upon Eleanor's containment chamber. Unfortunately, Lamb captures Delta, severs the bond between Eleanor and Delta by stopping the former's heart, and leaves him for dead. The good news is that Eleanor survived her mother's medical shenanigans. The bad news is that Delta is on borrowed time, as the bond can't be re-established once it's been broken. Eleanor then transforms herself into a big sister saves Delta, and they head together to an escape pod that Sinclair, the absolute broest of bros, has prepared just for them to the detriment of his own safety and chances to escape Rapture. The pair soon discover that Lamb has turned Sinclair into a big daddy. Sinclair, with the last crumbs of free will remaining following his transformation, begs the pair to kill him, which they begrudgingly do. Tragedy soon strikes again when Delta is mortally wounded by a bomb, as him and Eleanor, now reinforced by a group of little sisters who helped them do this, I don't know, it's not explained, just bear with me, ascend to the surface. Depending on Delta's choices throughout the story, the ending plays out in one of three ways. Rescuing all little sisters and sparing all of Lamb's main followers results in the good ending, where Eleanor absorbs the memories of her dying spiritual father and sets about to change the world for the better. If Delta harvested all the little sisters he encountered and killed Lamb's whole posse, Eleanor will absorb Delta's Adam and become a mustache Link villain hell bent on world domination. Interestingly, a mix of rescuing and harvesting little sisters gives Delta a choice. He can let Eleanor absorb his Adam or stop her, which will cause Eleanor to mourn his death and leave to make her own way in life. So basically, a bittersweet ending that I personally feel is the right one for the kind of story Bioshock 2 is trying to tell, but deep in my heart, I'm a sucker for happy endings, so you know. So here comes the take that will surprise absolutely nobody. I am 100% of the belief that Bioshock 2's story is superior to the original game. The Bioshock 2 is a rehash of the first game discourse bothers me to my very core. I'd pull some quotes from contemporaneous reviews, but I know that would do nothing but upset me and turn this section into a senseless rant. So instead of pouring over 12 year old hatchet jobs, let's at least try to find out why opinions were so split. I'll go out on a limb and say that the lack of a game change pun intended late story twist had something to do with this. Bioshock's infamous would you kindly twist that downright recontextualized everything that players had experienced up until that point. In case you need a refresher, and I'm sure you don't, but I gotta go over this for the sake of clarity, towards the end of Bioshock's campaign you find out that Jack was actually Ryan's illegitimate son, that he was sold by Ryan's mistress to Fontaine as an embryo, aged rapidly into adulthood by Tenenbaum and Su Chong and smuggled to the surface with false memories. That he was a pawn in Fontaine's schemes, a sleeper agent to be called back to Rapture when needed. That he was genetically constructed to do Fontaine's bidding upon hearing an unassuming hypnotic trigger. That trigger being would you kindly. A phrase which Ryan, knowing full well that he was finished, uses to compel Jack to beat him to death with a golf club, dying of his own free will and humiliating Jack one last time. And just when you thought things could get worse, Bioshock pulls the rug from under you with one last reveal. Atlas, the friendly, mild-mannered Irishman who had guided you throughout the game, was Fontaine all along. The elusive, ruthless gangster, Ryan's arch-nemesis who, in one last attempt to best the fallen tycoon, faked his own death and tore down his empire, brick by brick from the shadows. It was an incredible fucking twist that rocked the gaming industry. 
And also the reason why Bioshock 2 stood no chance. Because you see, Bioshock's story is smaller, more personal in scope. While the original game put Rapture at the center, in Bioshock 2 the focus is firmly on the relation between Delta and Eleanor, and the former's quest to save his spiritual daughter from the clutches of her narcissistic mother. You could argue that their bond is artificial, and you'd be absolutely right, because it was literally the result of some in-universe scientific machinations gone wrong. If subject Delta or rather the man he was before being turned into a big daddy hadn't accidentally come across Rapture, as the lore cryptically hints, any other person could have ended up in his place. However, the game suggests that there was something more to the bond between Alpha series big daddies and little sisters. That this artificiality doesn't make their bond any less genuine. This raises a ton of head-spinning philosophical questions that I'm not qualified to address in any way. So instead, I'm gonna take the intellectual shortcut otherwise known as this reminds me of another thing I like. Delta and Eleanor's bond reminds me of a criminally underrated TV show called The Americans. It's about two deep cover KGB sleeper agents posing as a regular American family in 1980s Washington DC. They'd both been recruited into the KGB's illegals program during the 60s, had the American way of life trained into them, eventually even losing their accents, and shipped to the US under fake identities. To add another layer of authenticity to their cover, they had two American-born kids who they kept in the dark about their double lives. Over the years, their relationship evolves from professional icy cold to genuinely affectionate, eventually feeling the closest thing to love such an arrangement could possibly permit. So considering all of the above, does this, let's say, special situation make their relationship any less real, a relationship that was, mind you, carefully and methodically constructed by a criminal regime to destabilize a democratic country from the inside. Obviously, Eleanor's and Delta's circumstances are different on the surface, but on a fundamental level, it's almost the same thing. With their bond being literally engineered by a group of amoral scientists to further the nefarious goals of Rapture's elite. Bioshock 2, like the Americans, poses some difficult questions whose meaning I started fully grasping only when I sat down and began writing the script. Despite its apparent sweetness and innocence, one can't deny there's a layer of tragedy and darkness to Delta and Eleanor's bond. What's truly brilliant about Bioshock 2's plot is that it also works as a simple yet well-written father saves daughter story. If you don't care about the deeper implications, that's fine, the game never beats you over the head with them. And this is basically why I think Bioshock 2 surpasses the original game in the narrative department. Not despite lacking a brain fucky would you kindly twist or the holy shit factor of something like Fort Frolic but because of it. But here's the kicker, 2K Marin could have just as easily left the political critique to the original game and focus on the narrative. Instead they doubled down and presented the other side of the coin. And boy did they fucking deliver. Bioshock 2's Rapture is a quite different place from Bioshock 1's Rapture. I mean, it's still the same shithole, don't get me wrong, but on a whole other level. 1960 Rapture was characterized by a shit has hit the fan, but not so bad that they couldn't turn things around sort of aesthetic. Whereas 1968 Rapture is a place of total decay. Improvised defense perimeters converted into shanty towns, ocean water bursting through holes caused by years of fighting and neglect, there are signs of irredeemable damage everywhere you look. Nothing, even the most skilled of engineers, could revert this place to its former Andrew Ryan era beauty. What's interesting is that Andrew Ryan's shadow looms over Rapture, even now, nearly 10 years after his demise. Even with a new player in town, Bioshock 2 dedicates just as much time to exploring Andrew Ryan's politics as the current antagonist. Only now, we have the benefit of having witnessed his ambitions to build an objectivist utopia fail, which makes his ideology and motivations even more interesting to explore. I've I've already covered this topic in my Bioshock video. What I will say is that a certain level called Ryan's Amusements is one of the best character studies I've ever seen in a video game. Yes, you heard me right. 2K Marin writers gathered in a room one day, decided they're gonna compress the psyche of an incredibly layered individual into a tacky amusement park and they somehow made it work. And as if building an entire level around Andrew Ryan's indoctrination program masked as family-friendly entertainment wasn't enough, they also added another layer by suggesting, but very subtly, that Ryan realized on some level that it's all bullshit. Not the amusement park, but his whole ideology. 
Because how could his beloved objectivism, an ideology that by its very nature places the individual on the very top and rejects altruism altogether, lead to a fair and equal society? Look, I'm in no way suggesting that Ryan had a sudden change of heart or anything like that, but it's interesting to note that even Andrew Ryan, with all his fanaticism, had some doubts regarding the feasibility of his social experiment. He knew that were Rapture to fall, this amusement park would would stand as a monument to his hypocrisy. Contrast that with Sophia Lamb, Ryan's counterpart and a polar opposite in every conceivable manner. Dr. Sophia Lamb's philosophy is collectivism, taken to the point where the individual's needs are entirely disregarded in favor of a common good of her own conception. Naturally, her fanaticism and anti-establishment rhetoric has spawned a quite sturdy cult of personality around her. If that sounds par for the core as far as Bioshock villains go, believe it or not, it gets even more messy than this due to the lengths she's willing to go to accomplish her goals. Basically, her life's project, which is creating the perfect selfless utopian, requires a certain amount of, let's say, unethical bioengineering that may or may not be based on unproven scientific methods. To do this, she needs a shit ton of Adam. Good thing they have all those little sisters living in Rapture Rent Free, right? Well, uh, no, because the little sisters have grown and the older they get, the more feral and unstable they become. So she turned those little sisters into big sisters and sent them to the surface to kidnap children for the purposes of converting them into new little sisters. Also, like any autocrat worth their salt, Lamb has established protection rackets throughout the city and she rejects even the slightest opposition to her ideology. Violently, of course. A, a far cry from the intellectual activist who used to challenge Ryan to public debates. But there is more to Sophia Lamb's character than her fanatical drive to create an altruistic society. Certain audio diaries shed some light on her background. Apparently she grew up in an intellectually driven, highly competitive family. An unhinged desire to win at all costs was ingrained in her, so much so that she was incapable of the self-awareness and introspection necessary to, you know, notice the flaws in her ideology. By far the most evocative demonstration of the kind of person she is comes in the form of an audio diary that depicts her playing poker with her acolytes and winning only to distribute her winnings to the participants. This was Lamb's way of balancing her collectivist ideals with her desire to win. Oh man, such a great piece of writing from 2K Marin. And I think that's everything I have to say about Lamb herself. She's a great, well fleshed out villain. Maybe not as interesting as Ryan, but to be honest, that's a high bar to surpass. Before we go, there's one more stop we have to make. That being Bioshock 2's excellent DLC, Minerva's Den. Minerva's Den is the absolute standard of quality developers should aspire to when making DLCs. And as a diehard fan of the original Dishonored's DLCs, yes, I know I talk about that fucking game every single video, I don't say this lightly. Minerva's Den is a textbook case on how constraints can actually make you more creative. After the completion of Bioshock 2, Steve Gaynor and a team of 9 people were tasked with creating a short 3 to 5 hour single player experience set in a yet unseen area of Rapture. The gist they were on a tight deadline and were to use as many assets from Bioshock 2 as possible. Interestingly, this ended up being a blessing in disguise, as the constraints allowed them to focus on creating a tight, character-driven story and paradoxically take more creative risks than normal. The small size of the team and the scope of the project also made a highly collaborative and fluid workflow feasible, with team roles often intertwining. This resulted in the game having a very organic feel to it, and you can really tell by playing it 
forget that it was a collaborative effort. So what's this unseen area of rapture I mentioned earlier? What's the story behind it? While being interviewed for a job at 2K Marin, Steve Gaynor was asked to pitch a Bioshock 2 level. He proposed a story set in Rapture's computer core, revolving around an AI that would actually lead to the development of Shodan from the System Shock series. I absolutely love the idea of merging the two IPs in a shared universe. It may sound ridiculous, but if The Wire and The X-Files are officially part of the same universe, I mean, why wouldn't Bioshock and System Shock receive the same treatment? Anyway, this didn't come to fruition as the team decided to merge elements from both games and draw from era-appropriate technological developments, including the work of Alan Turing on early computing when creating the story and the setting. They eventually settled on a universe-appropriate steampunk AI, and that's how Minerva's Den came to be. As a casual history enthusiast who's never been that interested in the history of early computing, I gotta say this game's setting hooked me from the start. In a risky move, the team decided to adjust the order in which players would receive weapons and plasmids to encourage them to interact with the environment. This decision paid off in my case, as I found myself exploring and absorbing my surroundings with more enthusiasm than usual. It actually helped me notice this panel here, which led to a hidden workshop where an engineer had been working on building robotic little sisters that would potentially replace the organic ones. It's honestly baffling how much story and world building they managed to cram in such a tight space. It's the story of a place essential to Rapture's existence who used that leverage to carve its own path and obtain a certain degree of autonomy from the rest of the city. Even the ambient sounds tell their own story of a place once the absolute pinnacle of computing technology that is now barely hanging by a thread. Just listen to this. Minerva's Den does such a great job expanding on the original game and filling up some of the world building gaps. Like how do these automated systems work? Who set them up? Is there a centralized computer system automating like air filtration, temperature, gas, the distribution of portable water and stuff? The DLC answers all of these questions and it's really nice to observe how these logistical details fit into the functional environments the developers designed for Bioshock 1 and 2. The main plot which I'm not gonna a spoil here centers around free will and identity. The story puts you in the role of Subject Sigma, the 11th Big Daddy from the Alpha series. This time around the guiding voice is Charles Milton Porter, a brilliant scientist who tasks you with reaching his supercomputer called the Thinker. He wants you to retrieve its schematics so he can rebuild it on the surface or some nerd shit like that. Anyways, opposite to him is Reed Wall who wants you to not do that. The reason behind Porter's and Wall's beef is a let's say professional incompatibility as to the purpose of this computer. Porter wants to rebuild it on the surface and find a cure for Adam's sickness. Reed, driven mad after years of injecting, believes he can program the computer to predict the future. Also, as any horror story involving an AI goes, Wall has become obsessed with solving a so-called absolute predictive equation. It's not clear what exactly he intends to do with this equation once it's solved, but he does mention the stock market at some point. Since we're we're talking early Alan Turing computing here and cryptography, maybe he's the first in-universe crypto bro? I don't know. Anyways, chronologically speaking, it takes place 8 years after the original game and concurrent with the events of Bioshock 2. As a result, Minerva Denzis and Bioshock 2's story overlap in some very cool ways. For example, in an audio diary, Porter recalls Lamb aggressively courting him to join her collectivist cult. After months of insistence, Porter basically told her to fuck off. Otherwise, he'll pull the plug on the central computing system and leave them for dead. A cool story moment and also a great way to just the Rapture family's absence from Minerva's Den. All in all, Minerva's Den is, at its core, <laughs> a personal story about identity and free will. Being so short, it features a smaller cast of characters, but they're so fleshed out and well written that I kinda wanted Minerva's Den to have a longer runtime, even though the length is perfect as it is. Yeah, I'm gonna stop here. I already spoiled the ever loving fuck out of Bioshock 2, and spoiling Minerva's Den would be a 
kind of a dick move. From a gameplay perspective, Minerva's Den is pretty much Bioshock 2, but with some slight adjustments. You play as a big daddy and all the cool tools you had in Bioshock 2 are put at your disposal here as well. There's nothing much to say here honestly. First of all, upgrade stations are gone and now we have to find upgraded versions of weapons in the wild. There is a new weapon in the form of an iron laser, which fires a beam of concentrated energy and can be loaded with different ammo types. The best addition by far is a plasmid called Gravity Well. It's essentially a ball of super dense energy that explodes upon impact and sucks all nearby objects in a chaotic vortex of destruction. Think Recycler Grenade from Prey 2017, but without the added benefit of obtaining recyclable materials. Beyond its combat purposes, the Gravity Well can also be used to break through electromagnetic locks a new type of security system that can't be hacked. Honestly, my only complaint regarding the gravity well is that it wasn't included in the main campaign. I would have loved to see how it interacted with the wider, more open spaces from Bioshock 2, but what are you gonna do? Oh, and before I forget, remember the Adam Gathering mechanic from 2? It's... it's here too. <laughs> Thankfully, with just 3 levels, it's not that big a deal, but since harvesting or adopting little sisters has no impact on the ending, I don't see why they didn't just scrap this mechanic altogether. Overall, Minerva's Den is an outstanding piece of DLC that all developers should look up to when developing additional content for their games. The story is great, the tight world building of the Bioshock series is elevated even higher by its short runtime, and it's just good, I'm officially out of things to say. Let's wrap up. Robotic little sisters. Robotic little sisters. <laughs> sure, Mr. Ryan, we'll take that contract. Sure, yeah, we'll front all the R&D costs. No problem. And, and when the big daddies ignore the little robot girls and all your fancy field, uh, field tests, ah, uh, hell, what are we gonna do with all the full production run of these useless things? Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed my 7000 word rant on Bioshock 2. This video has been an emotional roller coaster to make because it's the first time in the history of this channel when I analyze like plot elements and themes. I figured it's the right video to do that since Bioshock 2 got such an undeserved bad rap for being an unworthy entry in the series. So yeah, if I manage to change even one person's mind with this video then I'll know I made at least a half decent job. As always, thank you for watching and a special thanks to my patrons whose generous support makes these videos possible. I'll see you next time.